My name is Emily. Uh, I'm one of the science educators with the Driving Discovery team. Uh, bonjour tout le monde. Uh, je m'appelle Emily. Je suis une éducatrice en sciences avec le moteur de la découverte. Uh, and as Jennifer said, I'm joined by my colleague Sabrina, uh, who will be taking over in a few minutes uh, for an exciting virtual hands-on activity. Now, just before we get started, I really want to encourage you to be active in the chat today, uh, since this is an interactive session. We'd love to get your ideas, your suggestions, your questions, uh, and anything else you'd like to share with us. Uh, you are the ones who will be guiding this inquiry today. So please participate as much as you are able to. Uh, and just to give you a sense of who Driving Discovery is and what resources we offer, uh, I'm going to do just a brief overview, uh, and then Sabrina is going to take it over uh, from there. So Driving Discovery is a collaborative initiative spearheaded by the Discovery Center here in Halifax, as well as the EECD. Uh, and we act as a resource to support teachers and learners as they transition to a new inquiry-based curriculum. Our mission is to provide high quality bilingual and inquiry based STEAM programming that can act as that support for teachers in this transition. Now, ultimately, we're working with educators to build the next generation of innovative problem solvers, and we aim to break down those barriers, those silos between subject areas, uh, and foster curiosity and wonder in our learners by making STEAM inspiring, accessible, and fun, all while including as many different Nova Scotian perspectives as possible. Uh, since February of 2019, we have been all across the province, uh, from Yarmouth to Cape Breton to River Hibbert, uh, visiting 22 schools, 117 classrooms, and over 2,600 learners. So they've had quite an exciting time. It's been quite a rush, and we can't wait to see what happens this coming year. Now, to give you a sense of the resources that we offer, I'm going to bring up our slides, and we can talk a bit about our workshops as well as those supporting documents and resources. All right, awesome. So we offer workshops uh, as our first resource. We offer workshops for grade seven as well as grade eight. Uh, our grade seven workshop offerings uh, include the greenhouse effect or le fait de serre, uh, as well as animated earth ou terre dynamique. Uh, the greenhouse effect centers around the driving question of how can we construct a solution to the environmental, agricultural, and social needs of the future. Ou comment peut-on construire une solution pour les besoins environnementaux, agricoles et sociaux de l'avenir? Now, this workshop has learners brainstorming problems to solve and figuring out how they can solve those problems of the future with their own model greenhouse. Uh, and then we have Animated Earth, which centers around the question of how can we analyze the sources and consequences of geological change on a global and local scale? Ou comment peut-on analyser les sources et les conséquences des changements géologiques à l'échelle mondiale et locale? Uh, so this puts learners uh, in the role of a detective almost, and they're looking at different landforms across Nova Scotia to see if they can figure out what might have caused these landforms, what might have impacted them uh, in terms of the geology and the changes in the geology across Nova Scotia. For our grade eight workshops, uh, our first one that we offer is the Hydraulic Arcade, ou Arcade Hydraulique. Uh, this centers around the question of how can we investigate the power of air and water and their ability to do work? Ou comment peut-on examiner la puissance de l'air et de l'eau et leur capacité à fournir de l'énergie? This one's a really action-packed workshop. Uh, we go around in different stations where learners take the role uh, of an engineer and they're figuring out how different hydraulic and pneumatic devices, including one body system, work uh, with the goal of, at the end of the workshop, starting to think about how they could develop their very own hydraulic or pneumatic device to do work for them. We also have a version of the greenhouse effect for grade eight. Uh, so it's slightly different than the constructing a greenhouse to solve a problem for the future uh, that we see in the grade seven greenhouse effect. Uh, for grade eight, we focus more on heat capacity, heat transfer, and the greenhouse effect itself. So we center around the question of how can we create a model that demonstrates an understanding of the underlying concepts of climate change and potential responses. Ou comment peut-on créer un modèle qui démontre une compréhension des concepts fondamentaux du changement climatique et des réponses potentielles? And brand new this year, we will have uh, another workshop for grade eight that centers around the Healthy Cells, Healthy Systems unit. Uh, so that's what Sabrina is going to talk a little bit more about uh, coming up. So she'll give you more information about what that workshop will entail. 
Now, to access our resources, uh, all you need to do is access your Moodle. Uh, so we'll share the instructions in a PDF document with our slides for you. Uh, but you can also access these uh, through your e-learning website. So once you've logged in for the first time, uh, you can access the Moodle there on the launch page. And then once you open up the Moodle, uh, just click on Teacher Supports. You can see down at the bottom there. And then there we are on the very far right, we are the Driving Discovery tab, and all of our resources will be available under that tab there. What are our uh, documents and resources on the Moodle? Uh, well, to start, we have our inquiry cards, which are our learner and teacher inquiry cards that we provide during the workshop. So these go through the breakdown of the skill that we're trying to tackle. They give uh, sort of a set up for our goals for the workshop and explain what we'll be doing a little bit, uh, what sort of questions we want to be asking, uh, what sort of things we want to be thinking about. Uh, we also have our research cards. So down at the bottom on the left, we have uh, an example inquiry card. And then on the right, we have an example research card. And our research cards are meant to give a little bit of more information to learners, just a bit of background context uh, to help them get through the workshop on their own. And we also have our offshoots. So our offshoots are our uh, extension activities. So these are to help us avoid our workshops being a one-off learning experience. They take the concepts and the activities that we do in the workshop and they extend them past the time that we are in the classroom. And they connect them to different areas of the curriculum, different subjects, uh, different concepts maybe, uh, just to get learners thinking about how everything is connected and how they can continue learning even after the workshop is done. And new this year, uh, we have a couple of adaptations for our workshops uh, with all of the uncertainty surrounding the COVID-19 situation. Uh, we've been adapting all of our programs just to make sure that no matter what happens in September and beyond, we are still available as the best resource we can be for teachers and learners uh, in an inquiry-based way. So some of those adaptations include uh, preparing for a virtual delivery of our workshops, uh, should we not be able to be in your classrooms. Uh, and that might include some videos uh, so that we can support your facilitation of the workshop. Uh, and that would be supported by worksheets for your learners to stay on track, uh, to help you figure out the best way to facilitate this for your learners, should we not be able to be in your classroom. And once again, we have our new grade eight cells and systems workshop. So now it is time for me to pass you over to Zabrina. And she's going to take it from here and tell us a little bit more about the workshop. So as Emily mentioned, um, I'm going to be taking you through our fun, exciting new cells and systems workshop. It is so new that it doesn't even have a name yet. So let me first welcome you to our second session. A number of resources are available from our session yesterday afternoon that goes through uh, where Emily went through our process for developing our resources. But today, you're in for a treat because I'm going to be walking you through what a program in the classroom would really look like, at least in a virtual setting. So as Emily mentioned before, we definitely encourage you to stay active in the chat. I'm going to be your hands, but this is going to be a choose your own experience. You're going to be the ones guiding our investigation and our assessments of a number of different case studies and patient profiles. So stay tuned, get ready and keep your wits about you. As well, because this workshop is so new, it's currently in development, it does mean that some of the resources that I'm going to be showing you and even some of the experiences I'll be walking through with you today might ultimately look a little bit different when you end up seeing it in your classroom. But we hope that this will give you a taste of what our resources really look like, as well as hopefully it will inspire you in ways that you can include inquiry in your own lesson plans and classrooms. So I'm just going to go ahead and pull up our presentation here. So as I mentioned, while some of these, uh, these experiences that I'm going to be going with through you with this morning might change, the goal of this workshop won't. And that's really to tackle that new grade eight science curriculum for healthy cells and healthy systems. Specifically, what we want to do is we want to empower learners to become healthcare providers and health science sleuths to try and determine how healthy systems function, to identify the interconnectedness of different body systems, and to try and figure out what can happen when things go wrong. 
and what that might look like, both in terms of a specific system, but also in terms of, uh, of a whole, more holistic view of the health of an entire body. And because we really do want to give you this experience, you are going to take on the role of learner. So today, you are no longer educators. For the rest of our session this, this morning, you guys are going to be healthcare providers, health science loops, and you're going to help to drive our inquiry. So we definitely encourage you to stay active in the chat. Emily is ready to shout out your ideas and your perspectives to me as we go through. And we're going to go ahead and dive right into our new workshop. And as we've said, it tackles the grade eight science unit for healthy cells and healthy systems, specifically the outcome of learners will evaluate ways to maintain and factors that disrupt cell and system health. And more particularly that indicator that focuses on the investigation of disruptions and disorders that impact health. So today and in this workshop, our driving question is, how can we investigate the health and function of different body systems? And we're going to be going through those different body systems using patient case studies. We have a number of profiles that offer personal information provided by four patients that walked into our clinic this morning, as well as, as you can see behind me, four different urine samples. So there's a lot to cover this morning and hopefully we'll be able to get through all of it. Um, so one of the things I did wanna mention is that the value of using case studies is that in addition to being able to see how these disorders and disruptions impact a human body by looking at the body itself, it also offers you an incredible opportunity to look at the human perspective to identify not only how that disorder impacts the body, but how it impacts the person. What are their concerns? What sort of worries are they, bring, are they bringing up to their physicians? So in order to do that, we are going to be engaging in some investigation. And because of the time we have this morning, we're not going to be able to cover the entire body, unfortunately. We're really focusing in on the excretory system. And to do that, we're going to investigate those patient case studies by asking and revising asking and revising questions, locating several relevant and dependable details to support an answer, organizing and comparing those details, identifying relationships, and if our luck holds out, recognize represented perspectives and communicate our findings. So to begin, let's start by asking and revising some questions. And I'm interested to hear from you, how should we frame our investigation? Where where is the right path? Does anything really jump out at you about the excretory system? The one thing that I would be interested in knowing is, what is it? What is the excretory system? What happens when we eat too much salt? Ooh, excellent. What happens when we eat too much salt? That's an excellent example of uh, an acute syndrome that we can investigate further. Yeah. So what ha does the excretory system do? What happens when we eat too much salt? How does our diet impact our health? Those are excellent questions. Anything else from the chat? Not yet, okay. Well, I do have a few questions about the excretory system that can help frame us a little bit. And if we know what the excretory system does, what it includes, what organs or what components are involved in the excretory system, I'm interested to know how we can identify when something has gone wrong. So if we can identify normal function in the excretory system, how can we identify abnormal function as well? So being able to break up those two different concepts or those two different questions into normal versus abnormal function might be a good way of helping us to steer the direction of our investigation this morning. So let's carry on to look at what that normal function does look like. So the excretory system, as the question about salt probably suggested to you, is a system that helps to make sure that proper filtration of our blood and waste removal from our body happens. So basically it's a way of our body making sure that nothing can accum accumulate in our bodies and in our blood that can later make us ill. So it includes the kidney that helps to filter the blood for us, the ureter that passes juvenile urine down to, for storage in the bladder, and then the urethra which allows blood, the urine to exit the bladder and take all of those wastes right along with it. So I do have a question here about how can we be sure that proper filtration and waste removal is taking place? And so how can we assess a patient to see if their system is working normally? And in order to do this, I'd like to investigate 
our first patient that walked into our clinic, Priyanka. Priyanka is going to act as our control. And I want to ask you, what is a control? Why would we want to use a control in a study like this? What is the value of using a control, particularly when you're looking at a number of different patients or a number of different case studies? Well, for myself, it's because I'm, I'm inherently lazy. The truth of the matter is I don't want to get precious about looking at specific values from my, my, my testing tools, my assessment tools. I want to be able to make a, those comparisons across a broad sweep of people. And by using Priyanka, our control as our baseline, we'll be able to identify when things go wrong. If somebody has a value that is higher or lower than our baseline, we know that something's up. So we don't have to get too particular about what exactly is wrong with that sample or what exactly that value means. We can just look at it as a range or as a comparison. So by using a control, we set a baseline that we can compare other things back to. So an incredibly powerful thing. So taking a close look at the information that Priyanka offered us this morning, Priyanka mentions that she came in this morning for her usual annual checkup. So nothing in particular brought her into our clinic today that was concerning. But is there anything else from her patient chart that you notice that might make you curious. She is feeling dizzy, yeah. So she came in for her usual annual checkup. She sometimes feels dizzy when she stands up too quickly, but she feels fine after a minute or so. I wonder if that might have something to do with her excretory system. Maybe there's another body system at play there. Interesting, anything else that you notice? One thing that jumps out at me is her age. She's quite young. So she is, oh, pardon my poor math. She's 18, so she's a young teenage woman. And there's one other thing I wanted to, to see if you guys can catch on this profile. But I do want to point out that we've asked both for her pronouns and for her anatomical sex. So let me steer you in that direction. Why might we have done that? Why might we have asked for both of those pieces of information? As a clinic, we want to make sure that our patients feel heard, that they feel valued, and that they feel that they can trust us to disclose information with us. So by asking for Priyanka's pronouns, we're showing that we respect her identity. And by asking for anatomical sex, well, the truth is different bodies are impacted by disorders and conditions in different ways. So a disease, a condition, or an illness may impact a male anatomy differently or more frequently than a female anatomy or vice versa. So on the one hand, we definitely want to respect the identities of our patients, but that other information of anatom anatomical sex is important from a clinical perspective. So now that we've taken a look at Priyanka's patient profile, I'm gonna switch us over to urine view so that you guys can get a, a better close-up look of the samples that are hanging out on the table behind me. All right, are you guys able to see everything behind me okay? Excellent. So, ladies and gentlemen, as I mentioned before, we've had four patients walk into our clinic this morning. We've got Marcus on the far left, Jamal, here on second to, to Marcus, Maria, and then Priyanka. So Priyanka is our control. I'm just gonna bring her forward so that you can see her a little bit better. Now, is there anything that you can see from Priyanka's urine sample, anything that really jumps out at you? Very clear. Very clear, absolutely. So if I were to take our contact information and hold it up behind our urine sample, you can probably see through her urine enough to be able to, if not read the text, at least be able to see it quite clearly. Anything else that jumps out at you? For instance, the color. What color is Priyanka's sample? It looks to me that it's a fairly pale yellow. Oh, perfect, excellent. So a pale yellow color, very clear, a good volume. I'm seeing that there's about 200 milliliters of urine. So a nice healthy sample for sure. Is there anything else that you want me to, to assess just using my senses before we get down to the tools? So I use my eyes. I mean, I could listen to the urine, but is there anything else I could do? I'm, I am going to reassure you that these are replica urine samples, so they are not real. Um, I made them up using some spices, cocoa, and water. Um, but as much as I care about you and your learning experience, I will not taste 
this year. But I noticed that, oh yes, thank you. So somebody mentions I should smell it. For you, I will do this, I'm going in. I should use the chemistry student waft though. And it's not great. It smells like pee, but it doesn't smell particularly strong. It's not foul or anything like that. It smells like urine, so it doesn't smell good, but it doesn't smell bad necessarily either. Okay, so we've used our sensory assessments. Let's bring out our tools. And we're going to be sharing with you a number of different websites that we like to use to make at-home analogs for all of the tools I'm going to be using today. So we'll be sharing those with our, um, our slides after our presentation this morning. But let me just walk you through the tools that we have available for our assessments today before you decide what I should assess first. So first off, we have this very fancy looking pH meter. So that would assess uh, acidity, neutrality, and basicity, basicness, basicity, irrelevant, the pH of our urine samples. We have a PASCO conductivity probe back here that would assess concentration, not only of total dissolved solids, which tell you exactly how much of any material is in the concentration of our urine, but also would measure conductivity, which would tell us a little bit more about the salts and mineral contents that you would normally expect to find in urine. So if there's a big disparity between the concentration of total dissolved solids and of the conductivity, that might tell us that there's something in the urine that doesn't belong there. I also have a brightness sensor here. This morning, I'm going to be using our Google Science Journal app. Emily mentioned it in our session yesterday afternoon. It's a incredibly powerful tool. It's a free app that you can download easily and you can pull up a number of different things to examine. So yesterday we were talking about how we assessed loudness. And if I scroll over to loudness, you can see just how loud I am this morning. So as I keep talking, you can see the loudness of my voice. And if I stop, you can see that the sensor is picking up on the ambient sounds of the room. That is not useful for me this morning with our urine. So instead we're looking at brightness. And as you can see, the ambient brightness of the room read by the sensor that tells your phone whether or not a flash is needed is hovering right around two exposure values. That means that there's enough light coming in to hit the sensor that it is uh, exposing it to about two, two units of value. So that tells you a little bit about what exactly is blocking the access of the ambient light in the room to the sensor at the back of the phone. So last but not least, you might have noticed this cute little microscope kicking around back here so we can get a really close view of exactly what is inside of the urine, so what the contents of the urine really look like. So now that I've walked you through all of the different tools that we have available to us, where should I start? What do you want me to assess first? pH, excellent, Sarah, I am on it for you. So according to our very, very fancy pH meter, our tap water is around 6.8. So if neutral is around seven, our tap water at 6.8 is very, very close to neutral. So in comparison, Priyanka's pH is about 6.3. So still pretty neutral, but a little bit closer to acid. So slightly acidic, but largely neutral, excellent. What's next? Conductivity. Conductivity, excellent. So for this, I am bringing out our PASCO sensor. And according to our sensor, tap water is, has a conductivity of about 92 microsiemens per centimeter. Priyanka's sample has a conductivity of about 8,500. So there's a lot of stuff, a lot of salts in her urine, but I don't think this is particularly concerning. It'll be interesting to see in comparison with the other values. I'm gonna switch, switch us over to total concentration. So our total dissolved solids reveal about 6,500 milligrams per liter. So again, so far so good. Okay. Oh, density. Heidi, that would be an excellent thing to take a look at. There's a really interesting way of using specific gravity to pick up on concentration, but I'm afraid today I don't have a scale with me to 
do a, a density assessment, but I really like where you're going with this. We could look at sugars or proteins. Oh, for sure. So if I were able to do a more in-depth assessment with some other tools, those are some excellent points of view. Yeah, yeah. For this morning, I have brightness and microscopy left to perform. So we were talking a little bit about how much, uh, how clear Priyanka's solution was. We were able to read our contact information through it. But how, what does that really mean? And to do this, I'm going to bring out that Google Science Journal. So once again, the ambient room light is about hovering around 2.7, 2.8. And if I line up Priyanka's sensor, it drops down to 1.4. So for all that, it looks quite clear. It is still blocking some of our light for sure. And our last assessment that I'm going to perform is microscopy. So earlier today, I took a swab of Priyanka's urine for you. And looking at it under a microscope, So we mentioned before that the kidneys really work to help filter waste out of the blood and help to get rid of trash out of the body before it can make us sick. And that's really what I'm seeing in her sample. I'm seeing some broken up pieces of skin cells, red blood cells, nothing too interesting or surprising at all. So it looks to me like microscopy is coming up normal. So we've gone through each of our assessments. And so far, Priyanka's pretty boring, which is what you would want from our con a control. So if I pull up her results, just so that we can take a closer look at them. So as we said before, and as was pointed out in the chat, Priyanka came in for her usual annual checkup. She's a young woman feeling slightly dizzy when she stands up too quickly. And her results show very, very normal health. So plenty of volume, clear and transparent. I can attest there was no real strong smell. Pale yellow, no evidence of any red color in her urine either, which might mean that there's something in there that doesn't belong. Her brightness had a value of 1.4. It'll be interesting to see what that means in comparison with our other samples this morning. pH of slightly acidic to neutral generally appears to have normal conductivity and normal concentration and nothing particularly worth noting in her microscopic assessment. So all things considered, Priyanka is boring. Excellent. That's what we want. So knowing that what Priyanka's results are, let's take a look at what, what normal function looks like. So when I was talking to her a little bit this morning, she mentions that she generally pees five to seven times a day, that she doesn't feel any pain or discomfort. She has a normal appetite and energy level. And there isn't really anything besides that dizziness that she wanted to bring up in the clinic. She has good hygiene, nothing really interesting in her family history, make sure she gets her exercise, stays hydrated. And there wasn't anything from her assessments that made me think that we should do any blood tests or medical imaging, though I did definitely appreciate, was it Heidi that suggested looking at proteins and sugars? So for some of our other patients, that would be something we might wanna pursue later on with other, with other tools available. So bearing in mind what normal values look like, these are our other patients. As I mentioned, we have Maria, Jamal, and Marcus. And before we look at our next patient, and we really probably only have time to look at one more person, what do you notice just looking at their profiles? Is there anything that really jumps out at you that makes you curious about them? Marcus are much older. Maria and Marcus are a little bit older. Yeah. So Jamal, little baby nugget, is only about is he 12. He just turned 12 in February. Yeah. Maria, on the other hand, is, is closer in age to Priyanka. She's another young woman. So she is 22, just turned 22 on the 13th. Marcus, on the other hand, is our oldest patient today, and he is 55. So quite a bit older than the other patients this morning. Anything else that you notice about them? Well, kind of touching again on age, Jamal mentions that his mom is who made him come in this morning, that she noticed some mood changes in him, that he's been really cranky and rude, feels like he's nauseous, like his head hurts a lot, and he just wants to go to bed. Poor babe. I'll give you one more second. And while we're thinking, while we're noticing things about the profiles, I want you to think about 
who do you want to assess? We've only got time for one more patient, so so choose your Pokemon wisely. Who who are we going to investigate this morning? Will it be Maria, who mentions that the skin around her genitals is extremely itchy and sore, burning sensation when she pees? Will it be little baby nugget Jamal or Marcus, who is 55, feeling really fatigued, loses his train of thought, has has trouble um, keeping his concentration, not been very hungry. He's also lost a fair bit of weight, he mentioned. Always thirsty, feels like he has to pee all the time, but not a lot comes out. And when I was talking to him earlier, I noticed that there was a lot of puffiness around his eyes and around his wrists as well. So who should we investigate this morning? Marcus, just Heidi. Heidi, I will do this for you. So Marcus is going to be our next patient. I'm just gonna hop right to his slides. All right, so Marcus again, feeling very tired, losing his train of thought a lot, not been very hungry, has lost a lot of weight, always thirsty, feels like he has to pee all the time and not a lot comes out. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen again for the sake of going back to urine view. And I'm just gonna pull out Priyanka again so that you can compare Marcus. So here is Marcus. And what is the first thing that you notice about his urine sample? The color. The color. Yeah, it's very, very dark. So we're looking at dark, dark brown, almost a reddish tinge, which is a little bit alarming. So very dark color, very little volume as well. So where Priyanka's level is up around the 200 milliliter mark, Marcus is down around 50. And I also noticed, maybe you guys can see, it looks like it's foamy a little bit. Do you see that? And that's pretty worrisome because when you find foam, foaming, uh, a solution that's foamy like this, particularly in urine, it might mean that there are proteins in the urine that do not belong there at all. And if I hold it up to the light, I see sediment down at the bottom. So. Oh, Heidi Brown mentions that I think he has prostate cancer. That is an excellent thing to note. So what sort of assessments could we do using the tools we have available to us this morning to confirm whether that might be the case? So sediment down at the bottom, very opaque, foamy, dark color. What is the first assessment that I should perform? I'm definitely interested in that clarity. So maybe I'll do that first. I'm going to, to bring out our Google Science Journal app, line it up. So once again, 1.4 for Priyanka, for Marcus. Oh, wow, it's 1.1. So very, very opaque. What else should I assess? You got it, Heidi? Okay. Oh, wow. So when I was looking at Priyanka's samples, I saw little fragmented pieces of tissues, little fragmented pieces of cells. For Marcus, I am seeing whole red blood cells. So these larger cells here are red blood cells. These smaller cells are white blood cells. So this is definitely alarming, a very good point. So. You wouldn't normally expect to see whole red blood cells, and that might actually explain the red color that we see in that really dark, dark urine. So it looks to me like Marcus's kidneys are just flushing everything out of his system. He's just trying to find balance however he can. So his body is getting rid of things that it would normally hold on to. So very, very alarming. Do you think that this is enough information for us to make our diagnosis, or is there anything else you wanted me to assess? pH, all right, so neutral pH of seven. Priyanka, our control was around 6.3. All right, Marcus, what do you got for me? 4.8, so very, very acidic in comparison to Priyanka. So Marcus is absolutely not well. Okay, since I'm here, I'm gonna perform a conductivity analysis as well.
Oh, buddy. So both Marcus's conductivity and concentration is more than twice that of Priyanka. So in addition to being dark in color, much smaller volume, presence of red blood cells, conductivity and concentration are very, very high. So let's take a look at a, a, just a contrast between the two. So perhaps I'm gonna- he has kidney disease. Oh, perhaps he has kidney disease. Yeah, Heidi, that's an excellent point. How does it smell? Oh, Natalie, okay. Ah, <laughs> uh, nope, nope. It's a very strong ammonia smell, very, very strong. It's where Priyanka was just sort of not nice. That's pretty desperately awful. Natalie, thank you for that. So I'm gonna go back to sharing our screen. Okay, oh, did it work? Nope, there we are. All right, so Marcus's results in contrast to Priyanka, very little volume, cloudy, and I would argue even more disturbing, foamy urine, very strong ammonia smell, can attest, can verify, not great. A reddish brown, very, very dark color, so very, very concentrated, more than twice as concentrated as Priyanka's, and a lot more cloudy, so 1.1 exposure units rather than 1.4. Very acidic in comparison to Priyanka as well, and really disturbing, those presence of red and white blood cells under the microscope, very, very alarming. So based on this contrast, was it Heidi who mentioned the possibility of kidney disease? Excellent. So, I mean, that seems like it could be, it would be interesting to see what the other patients look like. So I'm just going to scroll us back. And better check Marcus's medical history. Ooh, check Marcus's medical history. That's an excellent point. And we'll definitely come back to do that. So just to look at our other patients, and then we'll do a comparison of everybody all together, and we'll try and pinpoint what everyone has. So just to change gears a little bit away from a 55-year-old man with blood in his urine, let's move over to Maria for a second, who mentions that her genitals are extremely itchy and sore, feels a burning sensation when she pees. And when I was looking at her assessments earlier today, I saw that in many respects, she and Priyanka line up almost exactly in terms of color, even clarity, very small difference of 1.3 exposure value compared to 1.4, no evidence of blood in her urine, it's pale yellow, no strong smell. However, and I'm gonna hold this up to the camera and hope that you can see it. There is, down at the bottom of her sample, a thick, mucousy blob of something. And when I took a microscope slide of that, I saw that there was presence of yeast in Maria's urine. So in many respects, very similar to Priyanka, but yeast cells under a microscope, a little bit worrying. Looking at Jamal's results, once again, very young boy. His mom made him come in today. He's not feeling great. She's worried about his mood changes, his irritability, his tiredness. Jamal was talking to me a little bit, and he mentioned that he loves playing soccer. So he was playing with his friends all day and didn't really like that his mom made him come into the clinic this morning. When we were looking at his results, we saw that, once again, he had very little volume, and he had slightly clearer to cloudy urine. So looking at the brightness sensor, it was in line with um, Maria's urine. So a little bit more cloudy than Priyanka's, but certainly not as, as opaque as Marcus. Very strong ammonia smell. I do this for you and for the children. It was also a very dark color, but didn't have any evidence of blood. Quite concentrated. So again, twice as concentrated as Maria, or sorry, Priyanka's, but not as bad as Marcus's. Somebody said dehydrated. Ooh, dehydrated, hopping right too. I love that. So that could be interesting, especially where he was talking about wanting to play soccer all day long. So he was outside a lot. And that does kind of line up with some of the symptoms that we're seeing. So let's go ahead, skip Marcus for a second. And we'll just do that overall comparison of our four patients. So kind of uh, to compare between the four of them, is there anything that really jumps out at you as being a, something of interest between all of our patients today? Somebody mentioned, or Heidi mentioned that uh, when we were talking about Jamal, he might have a lack of electrolytes. 
Ooh, a lack of electrolytes. Yeah, you notice that there was that big difference between the conductivity components and the concentration units in his values. Yeah, so definitely, definitely concerning there. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else that really hops out at you as being of interesting, of interest or contrast? So I might ask, um, who has the most similar urine amongst the four patients? Jamal and Marcus. Ooh, Jamal and Marcus do have very similar color and volume. Um, I would say, though, I'm interested by the red in Marcus's sample. So there's definitely lots of red blood cells, but I like that. So Jamal and Marcus are very similar in terms of volume and color. Yeah. Any other similarities you notice between our patients? <clears throat> Priyanka and Maria. Priyanka and Maria have a lot of the same values, and they're also similar in age and gender, too. So that could be an interesting tie-in as well. Yeah. Who are the most different? Jamal might have been holding urine too long since he plays sports. Ooh, maybe there's nothing wrong with him at all, and he's just being a 12-year-old boy. Maybe, yeah, yeah. Uh, Heidi says Priyanka and Marcus are the most far apart. Mm, so Priyanka and Marcus show the biggest disparity, the biggest differences. And I think that that might mean that Marcus is perhaps the most ill of our patients. Do you guys agree? Okay, so let's take a look then at diagnosing our patients. So somebody mentioned that Jamal might be dehydrated, might be low on electrolytes, might have held his urine too long, that Marcus might have prostate cancer or kidney disease. Those are excellent, excellent points. What might be Maria's problem? Are you able to make a diagnosis with just this information alone? Well, something that might help you is to know what some common excretory system conditions are. So these are three or four uh, very common Canadian conditions that impact large member, large populations of Canadian citizens. So diabetes in general impact about 10% of Canadians. So for all that type 1 diabetes or juvenile diabetes impacts only about 1%. Diabetes in general impacts about a tenth of our population. Chronic kidney disease, again, 12.5% of Canadian adults experience chronic kidney disease, either minor to severe and sometimes fatal. Moderate dehydration and vaginal yeast infections are outrageously common. In fact, I would argue that I have been at least moderately dehydrated at some point in the last month. And as for vaginal yeast infections, about three out of four Canadian women experience those uh, symptoms of a vaginal yeast infection. And when I say Canadian women, I am specifically referring to those who have a female anatomy in this case. So these are all quite common um, and they might help to steer our investigation. So looking at the relationships between these conditions and some of the symptoms that we saw in our patients, are we able to make a diagnosis for say Jamal based on these four conditions alone? So Jamal was our 12-year-old nugget, loves playing soccer. Heidi mentioned that he might be dehydrated or low on electrolytes. So according to that information, would you guys propose that moderate dehydration is the most likely candidate for his diagnosis? Where this is an acute syndrome, we would want to give him some water, give him some rest to really confirm if those symptoms were to go away. I think he's likely dehydrated. But I think he's likely dehydrated. I, I think that's a good guess, a good bet, yeah. What about Maria, our young woman who in many ways lined up almost exactly with Priyanka, down to having um, the same clarity, color, everything. But she had one thing that Priyanka did not. What was that? Girl might have a yeast infection, yeah. So the presence of yeast in her urine is concerning, but it might not actually be a vaginal yeast infection. It might be a urinary tract infection. So one of the microscopic assessment notes on this card says that a vaginal swab should be taken to confirm that a vaginal yeast infection is present. So that might mean that the reproductive system is impacting the urinary tract system or the, the excretory system, but it might also be a urinary tract infection. So very interesting to continue up that assessment. Now, finally, for Mark, 
Marcos, we mentioned that we think he's probably the most ill. He showed the biggest difference between himself and his results and Priyanka. So do you think that he has type 1 diabetes or chronic kidney disease? And what is one simple test that we could perform right now to confirm? Natalie says chronic kidney disease. Natalie says chronic kidney disease. And I think that's probably the most likely. And that simple test I was talking about, of course it would be Natalie's mention, it was the smell. So when you're talking about diabetes, you often find that there's a very sickly, sweet, fruity smell to urine. That was actually how diabetes mellitus got its name hundreds of years ago. Physicians who had a lot more care for their patients than I do, I'm afraid, this morning for you, would sometimes smell and even taste urine samples from diabetes patients to uh, diagnose them. So amazing work, everyone. I think with a little bit more assessment on our patients, we had to come up with an excellent diagnosis for each of the folks that have walked into our clinic today. But we've done an amazing job of asking and revising questions about excretory system health and what malfunctions in the excretory system look like. We've located several relevant and dependable details to support an answer by looking at our patient studies, looking at our profiles, and looking at uh, our urine assessments. We've organized and compared details, both uh, between our patients and our control and amongst all of our patients. And we've identified relationships between some common Canadian conditions and the symptoms that they may have caused in our patients. So amazing job this morning, folks. I'm afraid that this is all we have time for today. So we're not going to get to recognize representative perspectives or communicate our findings, but that is by no means the end of the world because this offers a very excellent opportunity to find cross-disciplinary connections. So perhaps you can recognize representative perspectives with a social studies connection. Maybe look at why certain members of the population in certain socioeconomic groups or from certain racial backgrounds are impacted, impacted by certain conditions more than others. And for communicating your findings, there's a language arts connection here. Maybe you can have your learners go to somebody that they know who's living with a chronic disease and ask them not only how that chronic disease impacts their health, but how does it impact their life and get them to think about things from outside of a science perspective. So there's lots of opportunity and lots of flexibility in inquiry-based learning. Now, before we get to our question and answer session, I did want to reiterate that this has been a preview of our, our new grade eight health and cell, healthy cells, healthy systems workshop. So while some components of the workshop might change, this I hope has inspired you to uh, include inquiry-based learning and technology in your classrooms, either physically or virtually. And uh, moving into the new year, as Emily was talking about, we're going to be looking at an expansion of this curriculum to all grade seven and eight classrooms across the province, as well as an expansion of our support. We are here for you, whether you are looking for our resources, if you have any questions about the programming that we offer, how we develop our programs, or if you just wanted somebody to bounce ideas, ideas off of, we are very, very happy to support you however ever we can. And Emily did an excellent job of talking to you about our plans for developing and providing you with as many accessible PD and additional virtual resources as we can. So as I say, once more, we are here for you in whatever way that you need us. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for contributing to the chat today. This has been an excellent, excellent experience with everyone. And I'd be happy to field any questions that you might have. Oh, thank you, Rula. Rula mentions that it was a great activity. I, it's a lot of fun to perform, for sure. And it was really interesting and challenging to try and figure out how to do it in a virtual setting that still gave our learners uh, a chance to control the experience. So that's why I was trying to go for that choose your own adventure. But it's, it's yeah, it's a tough balance between having these great resources and wanting to actually have the kids touch them and handle them. So there's a challenge there, for sure. Heidi mentions that this was very nice. Grade seven and eights love investigating. Uh, same, honestly. Oh, thank you so much. So, um, mind naming the phone application again? Absolutely. It's called the Google Science Journal app, and it's available for Android and smartphone. I'm afraid it's not available yet for desktop devices, but it works on tablets and on smartphones. And 
information in yesterday's slideshow. Oh, and Emily points out that there's more information in yesterday's slideshow as well. I kind of hopped right into an active experiment, but in yesterday's session, Emily takes you through how to start an experiment and how to kind of use the, the tool itself. And the Pasco app was the Spark View app, which is also free to download for. Perfect. And she also wanted me to point out that when I was using the conductivity probe, the Pasco app is the Spark View app. And it's also freely downloadable and very easy to use as well. And the conductivity probe also works with the Google Science Journal app. So if in the heat of the moment you're not able to connect one app or another, there is an opportunity there to simply use the Google Science Journal app if you find that that works better for you. Oh, but Tracy, I, I hope you enjoy it. It's an incredibly powerful tool using the Google Science Journal app. Thank you, Tammy. If you are interested in pursuing the, the Google Science app a little bit further, you can save your experiments and kind of go back and track and compare different results over a period of time. And that's actually what we did with our session yesterday. We, off, we offered up an opportunity for some citizen science for members of the, the general Nova Scotian population. We asked them to send in different um, loudness values from wherever they lived or wherever they were traveling, and they were able to save their experiments onto their phone. And one of our colleagues actually sent all of that information to us. So it was incredibly powerful when we actually got to the point of analyzing the data. Oh, thank you, Anjali. Thank you for joining us this morning. Yes, I agree, Heidi. Citizen science is good. It makes people feel so empowered. It makes them see that science doesn't exist just in the lab, that you can experience science all around you all the time. Absolutely. Oh, Sarah, thank you so much for that point. I hope that we've inspired you and as I mentioned before, we're happy to share other ideas or, or be here to bounce your ideas off of if you have other, other points that you wanted to share with us later on. Absolutely. Yes, offshoots are for all of our programs, all of our workshops that we offer. Oh, so um, Natalie asks about offshoots. And absolutely, we will be offering offshoots for all of our programming. So we'll be coming up with some materials that will be associated with the health and science, or sorry, the, the Healthy Cells, Healthy Systems workshop as well. If you wanted to take this kind of platform, this kind of uh, arrangement of the choose your own adventure style, I should stop saying that. I'm sure it's trademarked somehow. Um, but if you wanted to, to take this idea and run with it, you are more than welcome to do so. I hope that this is a, a good support for you and a, a good way of including inquiry in kind of this, this more virtual setting. The benefit of this, of course, is that if your learners are at home and they don't have access to technology, they don't have access to, say, red cabbage juice as their natural pH indicator, there's still an opportunity for them to engage in investigation. Maybe a, a friend of theirs, a peer in their classroom, has a natural pH indicator that they could perform a test on or perform an assessment on. And maybe they could connect virtually in their own homes so that they can perform this assessment together. So there's, there's plenty of ways that you could make this as flexible as adaptable as you need. And thank you everybody for taking part in our, our session this morning. It was very fulfilling. That chat was, it was hard to keep track of at certain points. So thank you so much for being so engaged.